Hey everybody, today, uh, welcome to the What's New in OpenShift 410, the developer edition. I'm Serena Cakley Nichols, and I'm um, product manager for Odeo and OpenShift Dev Console. And I'm here with a bunch of my product manager friends. I'll hand off to Parag to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Parag Dave. I'm uh, the product manager for Developer Sandbox, uh, the upcoming App Studio uh, offering, and the uh, dependency handling things. And I'll hand it off to Stephen. Uh, to Rob, I think, first. Oh, sorry, Rob. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. see <laughs> No problem. I'm Rob Gormley. I'm the uh, product manager for OpenShift Builds. Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Lemer. I'm product manager for DevFile, SBO, Helm, and uh, GQ. Okay, sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the product manager for Code Ready Workspaces. Western India, Bangalore. Mohit. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Mohit. I'm based out of India, and I'm product manager for ID tooling. And and pass over to Shamak. Shamak here, uh, part of OpenShift product management team, looking after some of our layer products. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. So this uh, presentation is in addition to the presentation which uh, the broader OpenShift product management team recently presented. But today we're gonna be focusing on the developer and DevOps personas. Um, so just a reminder, back in February, you did see our What's New Dev, Dev Edition presentation, which focused on um, a look ahead in the next six to 12 months. But today's session is focused on what's being delivered in 410. Uh, as well as alongside 410, right? So feel free to use the relevant slides in this deck um, or customize and make them your own going forward. We'll start with a quick look back at our priorities for 2022, aligning both with Red Hat and our product portfolio vision and strategy. Um, our major priorities were around managed services, onboarding, and platform adoption. Today, you'll see some of the progress that we've made on these priorities with the release of OpenShift 410 and more. So let's get to it. We're gonna start uh, by a deep dive into the pieces of OpenShift itself, operators which unlock additional features, as well as tools that ship next to OpenShift, all of which enhance the experience and productivity of a developer or DevOps persona. And I will first hand off to Castori. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. And let's talk to uh, what's new in Code Ready Workspaces this quarter. This year, we're focusing on our architectural switch to their workspace. And uh, as you see in the slide, we're also going to go with a new name. Uh, this is more to align with the overall portfolio branding. And our new name would be Red Hat OpenShift Dev Spaces. Next slide for me, please. Thank you. So this year, we had two releases so far of Code Ready Workspaces version 2.14 and 2.15. The enhancements and changes uh, are aimed to making the product very much simpler, familiar, faster, and cloud native. Um, as you all know, our key personas are administrators and developers. And this quarter, we have a bunch of enhancements that would enhance the experience with the product. Uh, the, the big news is Code Ready Workspaces now support um, IBM Z and Linux One. It was a tech preview last quarter. Enhancement to the administrators include improved memory con uh, consumption, setting parameters like CPU quota. All this is to ensure that there will be, you know, no container in initialization failures and if it's a success and if it's a breeze for the administrators. Administrators can also now set storage size to align with the so storage size supported by the private cloud provider. So this was one of, um, these are a couple of big asks that the administrators wanted. So their lives become much easier than what it is today. From a developer's perspective, uh, the aim is to make the product more familiar with the tools and, and align with what OpenShift console provides. Support for dev file v2, providing new navigation link, um, allow developers to open OpenShift container platform web console from the dashboard through this link. And uh, like I said, uh, we, we are going through um, the switch to their workspace. Uh, so we also have in 2.15, a tech preview on how their workspaces look. Um, the reason why we are do, moving to a dev workspace engine is um, life becomes much simpler and easier for both uh, admins and the developers. 
Uh, for admin, it would mean um, the authentication and managing the workspaces is, is much simpler and easier and flexible. For developers, we are, we are bringing in plethora of familiar tools and also support for VS Code, IDE, Beyond Care, and JetBrains, which is um, the top ask uh, for, for, from the product. So that's what uh, was done in this quarter and much more coming up with both rename and uh, switch to their workspace. Um, that's pretty much from my side. Thank you and over to Stevan. Thank you, Kasturi. On dev files, so dev files are the way we, we are defining uh, portable developer environments, which include all the tools um, that are needed for the development of an application, either from inner loop and uh, also from the outer loop uh, point of view. Uh, next slide, please. And the outer loop is uh, actually something that is uh, new and that we had uh, into the version 2.2 of the specification. So we had the support for Docker file build and deploy uh, into uh, the definition of a, a developer environment uh, defined with a dev file. The dev file public registry is now entirely available from audio and from the developer catalog in uh, the OpenShift developer console uh, as well. And uh, we have been setting up uh, a dev file registry for the Red Hat products as well. A lot of efforts have been done uh, on revamping the documentation and helping the community and also our customers uh, to build their own dev files as well. And uh, last but not least, on, uh, on dev file, um, we have been accepted as a CNCF sandbox project. And we are also getting external contributions from uh, AWS and JetBrains. So there will be more things coming uh, on this front as well. On the Maven and Gradle Java tooling, so this is mostly about uh, Gcube, which enables the Java developers to build OpenShift Kubernetes artifacts with ease. Uh, it allows to either generate the, the, the containers using S2I, Docker, or Jib, uh, or generate the manifests that are needed for, uh, for Kubernetes. Could be for Kubernetes, van vanilla Kubernetes, OpenShift, but also generates M charts. Uh, it comes as a Maven plugin, and the Gradle uh, plugin is also something that is new uh, and that we had recently and which is getting a, a lot of improvements uh, at the moment. On the next slide, please. We have just released a version 1.7.0, uh, which is now uh, available. Um, in, the, in this latest version, all the images that are getting generated are now using Java 17. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have been doing a lot of improvements related to the Gradle support, especially on Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, uh, side, where we had the support for Vertex, Micronote, and OpenLiberty uh, generators, uh, as well as a number of uh, hardening tasks and bug fixes. On the generation of Helm charts directly from, uh, from Gcube, we had the ability to use YAML source files. And uh, also, we had a way to configure parameters, variables, and the values that YAML from a, from a Helm chart through uh, XML or DSL and using the, the dot notation uh, as well. And as a a good news on the project, we just reached the 100 of contributors on the project. So that's, uh, that's good. And that's showing a, a good health of, uh, of the project as well. Ending over to Moit. Uh, thanks, Steven. Uh, hello, everyone. So I will be basically discussing what improvements we have done with uh, respect to ID toolings. Uh, this quarter has been really great for uh, aligning our portfolio with respect to 
all the IDs we support, including Visual Studio Code, IntelliJ, and Eclipse. And these are some of uh, the products which we currently have and the enhancements what we have done. I'll start with OpenShift. Uh, one of the major improvements with OpenShift extension on Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ is that we currently allow users to uh, connect and provision their developer sandbox. Previously, user could have started their local OpenShift cluster using CoreD containers directly from the extension. And now we have also enabled them to provide one more way to run OpenShift and that's through developer sandbox. So uh, anyone who's working on with their OpenShift cluster, uh, they can just provision the sandbox instance from the ID and start working on it. Uh, this will be a continuous work and will continue in the next quarter too. Uh, one of the major improvements, what we have around serverless functions and Knative is that there is a new workflow which we have enabled for developers, both in Visual Studio Core and IntelliJ uh, with respect to serverless functions. and the extension is released on the marketplace for both the VS Code and IntelliJ. And we will be getting more collaboration around different upstream community, including VMware and other folks. Uh, the other major contribution around IntelliJ is that we right now have a support for Kubernetes extension. We around, allow people to work with the Kubernetes clusters and see all the cluster management. Uh, the logs and allowing them to work with the cluster with push of the workspace uh, projects. So that's active development, which is happening with respect to Kubernetes on the IntelliJ environment. Uh, the other scenario around Tekton is that we allow people, uh, if they want to continue working on their Tekton hub or, or Tekton custom task catalogs, they can directly work with their uh, clusters. And the support is also available both for Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ. Uh, one of the major improvements what we have around core ready workspaces was that in the previous release of core ready workspaces where uh, the openshift extension was added in the j registry it used to support an older version of dev file but now it supports the latest version of dev file as steven mentioned in the slides we uh, we are trying to make sure that we have the support of dev file across our portfolio and this is one of the major additions what we want to have with respect to the customers using core ready workspaces They'll have the support of dev file v2 in that and they can start using the openshift extension on top of it uh one of them uh announcement around uh, red hat core studio uh there's going to be a sunset of core studio which is going to happen next month around april 14th uh which means that there won't be any further release of core studio um but the work which is happening around Code Studio will continue to be actively worked and developed on JBoss tools. So that's that's an upstream uh, project from supported by Red Hat, and the collaboration which was happening on Core Ready Workspace will still continue to be on JBoss tool side. So that's a brief update what we have around the ID tooling for products. Uh, now I'll be moving what we support around the languages. So Red Hat has uh, multiple set of extensions in the VS Code marketplace, uh, which supports languages such as Java, Quarkus, YAML. And these extensions are one of the top uh, most used extensions by the developer community. Uh, Java uh, has approximately around 15 million installs. And we did a new release uh, this month itself, 1.4.0. And the next release is coming out uh, in the next month itself. One of the important features around the Java release was that now users can also run the pre-release versions of the extension. This works on the same lines how we used to run the nightly builds. So now from the VS Code ID itself, they would be able to select any pre-release and start working on it and uh, provide any feedback or see how the features will be rolled out in the major release. Uh, the other important workflow around Java extension is now it has been released based on platform specific. You now based on a different platform, the extensions have released. And we now support Mac OS M1 with respect to Mac OS Intel, what we have previously. So that's one of the improvements around VS Code Java. Uh, with respect to VS Code Quarkus, we did a release after a very long time. But this release is pretty much very significant because it allows you to have a language support for Kube templates. This was a very uh, important milestone for the uh, VS Code Quarkus. And, uh, there are multiple blocks which are out and there will be um, one more release which will happening soon around the support around Q templates and the Q language server. Uh, uh, other important factor was there has to be a collaboration between multiple ID extensions, what we support for our portfolio. And uh, the VS Code Quarkus and OpenShift extension is one of that integration. So now you can directly deploy your Quarkus application on top of an OpenShift cluster 
uh, using a very discoverable deploy to OpenShift command. So that's one of the major enhancements what we have done. Moving on to VS Code YAML, uh, this is also one of the heavily used ID extensions for developers. It allows approximately, as mentioned, 8 million installs. And we continue working on the built-in community support. What we have, we have also made a change into the YAML parser, which basically works that specific to your YAML version, uh, you can work on your YAML files, and that will basically is going to enhance your developer scenarios. So this is what we have uh, briefly from our portfolio for both ID tooling on the language side and the product side. And that's what I had. So thank you. And moving on to the next one to Serena. Thanks, Bohan. So I'm going to talk about ODO a little bit now. Um, so as we mentioned in our what's, uh, what's next presentation last time, we talked about ODO v3 coming out. Um, and focusing on three major goals, onboarding with guided experiences, providing inner and outer loop uh, support, as well as consistency between our entire portfolio. So what you'll see coming out in the next month or so is an announcement for our initial dev preview of Odeo V3. You can see an example here of what Odeo and it kind of looks like with the, the guided experience. And then on the next slide here, what you'll see is an example of what ODO deploy looks like with uh, the guided experience. So as I mentioned, Dev Preview will be in April. And the following commands will be available in Dev Preview, ODO login and log out, ODO init, Dev deploy, preference, build list, delete, version, and utils. And um, Tech Preview is planned for summer of 2022, including the remainder of our planned commands for ODO v3. So be on the lookout for that announcement and um, a blog as well, showing exactly what will be available. And now I think I'm gonna pass back over to Sivan. Yeah, so speaking, covering um, code-ready containers today because uh, Steve is on, uh, on PTO. Uh, so code-ready containers uh, is going to be renamed OpenShift Local uh, by May, so that is a, a, a major shift. Uh, similarly to the change in the name of Code Ready Workspaces, we want a better alignment with the brand and with the different uh, things that Code Ready Containers was uh, allowing to do. And it's really about running OpenShift uh, on your uh, on your desktop. Um, so it will be renamed OpenShift Local by May. So what's new? on uh, code ready containers uh, sorry uh, we have uh, work on uh, getting a smaller footprint during the download uh, so the bundle uh, which is getting download initially is uh, is smaller and then during the installation phase of uh, of uh, code ready containers it will download the different uh, uh, things that are needed for uh, for code ready containers there's two different presets that are now provided so the default one is openshift but you can also use code ready containers to uh, uh, to install uh, podman uh, which is much lighter to to run uh, the, the containers or in a, lo a local environment Along with this, there is also a new uh, electron-based tray application, which allows uh, developers to directly interact with code-ready containers or uh, Podman. And uh, it also provides a, a guided workflow to the user after the installation uh, of, uh, of code-ready containers so that everything is getting set up properly. And that's it for code ready containers moving to developer services and starting with uh, helm so as you know helm uh, is uh, is one of the most popular packaging uh, mechanism for uh, for kubernetes and we are continuing to integrate its capabilities onto uh, onto openshift so in the latest version of openshift we are supporting helm version 3.7.1 and we continue to provide an integrated uh, experience within the developer console so that the developers can do self-service consumption of the Helm charts directly from the developer catalog. The developer catalog can be uh, extended, so a customer might add their own 
custom M chart repository, uh, either at a cluster level, which was already available, and now with this new version of uh, OpenShift, we had the ability to um, to configure a custom M chart repository at a namespace or project uh, level, which will require less permission as well. So that enables the developers to configure uh, the uh, the M chart repository for their own needs in um, in a more constrained uh, uh, scope. In fact, we also are providing a certification process for our partners who want to distribute their products using M charts. Um, so we have new charts that are now available, including Fireware Orion, Node-RED for uh, IBM Edge, Lacework Agent, or Solace uh, PubSet Plus as well, and some others uh, as well. So that's for Helm. Uh, on service binding, so service binding is uh, really a way to enable the developers to easily connect their application to uh, backing, backing services. It manages the data plane for the application and the backing services by uh, injecting all the binding information directly uh, in the application uh, workloads so that the application can leverage the, the connectivity uh, information more easily. So we are providing a, a built-in built set of bindable uh, services, which are enabling the Red Hat portfolio, our managed services, and some other popular services. So we have extended that uh, uh, as well. On the next slide, please. Um, so. On uh, the uh, managed services, we have managed Kafka, Roda, uh, and there's few demos that are available. And we are also providing um, support for uh, some popular operators that are uh, existing uh, elsewhere. Uh, in this new version of OpenShift, there have been additions into the developer console to make it easier for a developer to uh, to connect an application to a backing service. And Serena will cover that in the developer console section. Thank you. And now ending over to Siamak. Oh, uh, Rob, sorry. Not a problem. So um, on the previous slide, you would have seen uh, OpenShift Builds is um, following a pattern earlier today, um, changing its name. Uh, we don't have the official announcement for that as yet, but it is working its way through the process. So some updates here. Um, we continue to um, release more functionality and features into CSI drivers, including the ability to handle uh, projected resources, you know, Red Hat entitlements, simple content access certificates, and so forth. And allowing those to be kind of shared in a manner that kind of supports um, namespaces and other kind of access control limits there too. Similarly, we also um, are allowing CSI volumes uh, to be mounted into a build. Um, this will help you know um, support this to those secret stores, projected resources, and so forth, and that allowing them not to be um, not to allow secure credentials to be required to be stored in container images there. We're also looking at the ability to, um, or have the ability to uh, build images using the source or binary of your local application and your workstation and push that up into um, your OpenShift instance there too. Shipwright builds uh, also supports our custom annotations and volume support there too. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, naming changes are going to be underway. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that V1 builds, which we'll probably start be referring to as V1 builds or classic builds, uh, is not going away. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can continue to deploy uh, V1 builds and maintain them, um, as well as the V2 builds, which are based off of the shipwright upstream. And those can coexist um, quite 
concurrently in parallel. The Jenkins operator has been deprecated and is unavailable as of 4.10 and will be not receiving any further updates. And we're moving more towards the um, pipeline as a service methodology there. And with that in mind, we're going to be continuing to work on improving the builds operator, get it updated and into the operator hub there to provide that functionality in the, that more native fashion there. That is all from OpenShift Builds. All right, uh, OpenShift Pipeline. So alongside OCP 4.10, Pipeline 1.7 uh, will be released. Uh, the highlights of this release are Pipeline as code that reaches uh, take preview that enables GitOps workflows for uh, for CIs. Pipeline will live in the Git repo and the executions will be on the cluster. Take down chains is another highlight of this release that is uh, reaching take preview and introduced into, into the product that enables once configured, uh, customers can automatically assign any images that are built within the pipeline using a variety of cryptographic schemes like uh, cosine from six store, X509 or uh, keyless and, and other uh, mechanism that are uh, experimental at the moment. Kickdown Hub is uh, introduced as well in this release as a take preview feature. So customers can enable Tecton Hub on the cluster and that would give them uh, their own version of Tecton Hub to be able to create uh, a list of tasks that they want to they expose within their organizations uh, to be used by their uh, dev teams and, and SRE and DevOps uh, engineers to build pipelines. And uh, another area that uh, is uh, is highlighted in this release is taking advantage of user namespaces in OCP 4.10 to be able to run tasks uh, in that namespace, which allows the, it, it opens the door for a uh, type of tooling that required to run privilege on OpenShift, like Builda, to run as a root within the container. But since it's running, the pod is running user namespaces, it's mapped to a non-root user on host, and uh, that would essentially remove the need for those tasks to run as privileged pods on the, on top of the platform. That's, like I said, build that, or also any other uh, tooling that customers might have that has this uh, requirements. And there are uh, a variety of improvements uh, within uh, the, the pipeline UI and dev console as well. I think it will go in more detail through as well in a little bit later. Next slide, please. Uh, GitOps 1.5 also will be available on OCP 4.10. That uh, brings along Argo CD 2.3. Uh, the highlights of this release are additional new generators around application sets. Application sets is um, uh, a hugely demanded uh, capability in Argo CD that allows uh, customers to generate applications based on a Git repo or the list of clusters in ACM or uh, some of the other aspects and two generators are added in this release that allows us to allow a uh, customer to configure our C Argo CD to, to, gen to create an application for every pull request so that they can create an application, sync the content of that pull, re pull request to a namespace perhaps uh, in order to deploy the content of it and, and run tests against it before accepting the pull request. And um, merge uh, generator is also added that allows merging the result of two different uh, generators for uh, for application sets. The other improvements are uh, more enhancements around the control over how certain fields need to get ignored uh, when Argo CD syncs manifest to the cluster. This is important when uh, there are objects on the cluster that there are multi that have multiple owners. Uh, there might be an operator on the cluster that owns uh, part of an, an object, a custom resource on the platform, and you want to have a different part of it in the Git repo. And you can you want to instruct Argo CD to ignore any of the differences on attributes that are that Argo CD is not in the owner of someone else is making changes to it. Next slide, please. That's yep. Okay, so now I'm gonna um do a deep dive into the developer experience uh, in for, inside of OpenShift Console itself. So in 4.10, we focused on improvements um, to building your application, monitoring your application, and portfolio enablement, specifically around serverless and um, pipelines. 
So the first page, the first slide here I'm talking about, we now have this capability of doing a quick search catalog from the ad page. So we had introduced this icon that looks like a book or catalog um, in a topology view a couple of releases ago. We're now also including that into the ad page, which just allows uh, users to quickly search for an item available in the catalog rather than having to browse. So um, it's a it's nice uh, efficiency type of improvement. In addition, in, if you go to the topology view inside of the dev console, which is also in the admin side, uh, we now have the capability of doing filter by label. So it used to only be filter by name. We've now introduced the ability to filter by label as well. This side panel, when you select an element inside the console, um, we have that side pan panel pop open. Um, and that is now resizable. And not only is it resizable from a width perspective, but that uh, width is remembered per user. So, um, the last selected item is also remembered per user, per project, per session. So if I'm in this project and have my Quarkus Quick Starts um, deployment selected and I move over to the Observe tab and then come back to Topology, it, that selection will be remembered. So again, just uh, some user usability enhancements here inside of Topology. Another thing that we've done around um, routes inside of the developer perspective is when we're doing import from Git and deploy image, we're now defaulting to secure routes. In doing that, what we also did was we are now exposing these defaults for our forms inside of user preferences. So inside of, in a top banner in the user menu, there's a user preference uh, section now that we released last, uh, I think in 4.9. And we've now added an applications tab, which allows you to set your routing options that are used as defaults for those um, those two forms in import from Git and deploy image. We've also made some minor improvements around just the general developer experience for front end devs. Um, so we got some feedback saying that people wanted to be able to quickly and, and easily kind of copy the route rather than just navigating it to the through the route decorator. So what we do now is um, as as you go through your import from Git flow, we are producing a toast notification, which has the ability to either drop right out into that new route or copy and paste it. And then we also have that copy um, capability inside the resources tab of the side panel for that route as well. Another thing that we've done is in the import from Git flow, um, if you are importing a node app and and using the builder image piece rather than dev files, we do provide or expose the capability of providing optional parameters for NPM run. Um, and again, so that that kind of helps some of those edge use cases, which weren't um, which builds weren't able to successfully build by by default. So you do have the ability to do this now with Node applications. Working off of something that um, Stevan had mentioned earlier, the create service binding action now does let you create service bindings in addition to dragging them. So before it was just a drag and a drop of an arrow, we now have a create service binding action that's available on deployments. With that action, all you have to do is, you get a modal, all you have to do is open up, um, is enter the name and select the, the bindable object that you want to bind to. So um, when you drag that connector handle from a deployment workload and drop it onto a bindable service, we also have a different flow where, I mean, it's the same flow, but we're uh, providing that default, that bindable service is already defaulted for you and you just enter the name and you're all set and ready to go. So again, making this command much more discoverable as well as easy to use. Another thing that um, Stevan did mention was extending the developer catalog with additional Helm charts, right? So uh, the CR name is called Project Helm Chart Repository. What we've done in 4.10 is we do have a quick start available. So if you look at the Helm Chart catalog, we do have um, some text in that description that allows you to enable a quick start. Right now, we are only able to do this through YAML, um, but this quick start steps you through that process of being able to um, create that project Helm Chart repository and expose additional Helm Charts inside the namespace that you're working in. Moving over to the serverless area, we have a number of improvements there as well. We're now visualizing event syncs and topology. Um, 
Currently, the users or developers are not able to create these through the UI, but post 410, we will be enabling that through the catalog. Right now, what you do see here, the red arrow is pointing to what the event sync looks like. It's the same um, symbol, the, the diamond shaped uh, symbol as an event source. The difference is that it does have a pod inside of it. And, and additionally, if you see where the label is, there's different icons depicting an event source to, versus an event sync. Um, when you select that event sync object, you do see the side panel as well, and it tells you what your output target is and shows you the associated pod with it. And of course, just like with any other resource, you can click in and drill into that um, panel at binding by clicking the link on that side panel. This is an RFE that we had um, implemented. So this is allows Kubernetes services to be syncable resources in the event source, the, uh, the event source flow. And it also allows um, Kubernetes resources, I'm sorry, Kubernetes services to be valid subscribers when either adding a subscription to a channel or adding a trigger to a broker. So again, um, just increasing our functionality and that was an RFE. Uh, going back to the pipeline stuff that Siamek had discussed, here's one of the improvements. We now provide a log snippet of failed pipelines. They're available in the pipeline run logs. So this previously wasn't available, so we're exposing it in the logs tab of a pipeline run when that pipeline run is failed. We also, in the import from Git flow, if there are multiple pipelines that are associated with that runtime, we do allow the user to, when, when they opt into adding a pipeline, we do allow the user to see the multiple pipelines and select them. And as they make those selections, that pipeline visualization would change so that they could not only see the name of the pipeline that's offered, but also see the tasks that are associated with it. <clears throat> So this is a nice, again, a nice enhancement, um, allowing the developer to kind of understand more of what they're selecting as well, as well as being able to have um, this stuff exposed in the UI, which it wasn't previously. And then this one is around guiding the user to add webhooks for pipeline updates. So previously webhooks had to be handled uh, manually, but now when you add a pipeline, um, when going through the import from Git flow, we do, generate that tecton trigger for you it's down here on the side panel again there's that copy command because you would need to copy that url and go to git to configure that repo um, appropriately so again a nice enhancement there okay now i'm going to talk a little bit about export applications so in 49 we introduced this export app command which is available with a GitOps primer operator um, Combining this feature with the import multi-doc YAML feature of 4.8 really enables developers to replicate the application in another project in the same cluster or in another cluster. What it does is it, it just um, provides a, a zip file of your YAML um, needed to re-import into to replicate that application. But what we've done in 4.10 is introduce some usability improvements for the feature. Um, so you can see here, we have added the ability to have a link that just says view logs. So if you want to watch the prog progress of your export application, that toast notification is issued when the user initiates export. But if you want, you can go look at the logs um, as it's uh, progressing. We also, if you have already started an export application and you try that command again, we do issue a modal. Um, if it's if an export is currently in progress, which allows you to either cancel that export, restart the export for some reason, or view the logs of the current export. And then we additionally, and, and this was this is the same as previously, but we do have that no, toast notification issued once that export is completed, so that you can download that that um, YAML. Another RFE that we did uh, address in 4.10 is the pod debug mode. This is available across the console in admin and dev. So um, it allows you to quickly troubleshoot misbehaving pods from the UI. So if something is a crash, if, the, if there is a crash looping pod, there is a capability of, uh, it shows a link to debug that container and brings you to um, the pod log area and, and 
is able to debug that container. It allows you to stop that pod from crashing, check environment variables, config variables, and also have access to logs and events once you start that container in that interactive shell. And last but not least, we do have another RFE, which is improved quota visibility. Previously, de developers weren't able to view their, their usage, uh, their quota usage inside of the console because they weren't, uh, weren't privileged. So we've now exposed a new area in the project detail page, which does allow you to see their usage. So you can see the CPU request limit and memory, request and, and memory limit um, per user here. And that's associated with the applied cluster resource quota CR. And with that, we're going to pop over to Dev Sandbox, and I'm going to give a second to see if Parag is um, going to present. Otherwise, I will. Yeah, we have a few minutes. We can talk about Perfect. it. Perfect. <laughs> so um, the developer sandbox has been upgraded to 4.10. So as you know, we keep up with the releases as soon as they go GA. So we have 4.10 on sandbox for a few weeks now. Uh, we've added uh, you know, new operators, the web terminal operators on it. The GitOps primer operator is very interesting. That allows you to export your applications and some of the artifacts into files, which, which you can then import into another cluster. So you can kind of take your application setup with you when you go out of the sandbox into a different cluster. We also enabled um, some of the managed services uh, operators on it, uh, the latest one being for Rhoda. So now you can uh, use connected databases from the developer sandbox instead of running databases into templates uh, onto your cluster. So that's there. So that's exciting. Next slide, please. Um, and we've added a bunch of new quick starts, one of them being about uh, how to do a Quarkus based serverless uh, application. So that's there available. So folks can enjoy that. And next slide, please. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Parag. So here's our additional resources. We've got blogs and upstream community links. Um, as always, if you're interested in connecting with us, we have a PM mail list, devtools-pm at redhat.com, or you connect, can connect with any of us individually. We also have a Google chat that's available. Um, and then finally, we do just have a couple of resources stated here too. So thanks for joining us and learning more about what's available at OpenShift Quartet and all of the associated uh, products that we have for our developers. Thanks, everybody.